God is the God of fresh starts, new beginnings, and second chances. God is the God of glory days. And if you could use some, welcome to Glory Days, a study of the life and the book of Joshua. God gave him and the Hebrews a promised land life, and he offers you the same. Joshua's story might be exactly what you need. Let's begin by making our Glory Days declaration. Fill your lungs with air and your hearts with hope. Let's say it like we mean it, shall we? These days are glory days. My past is past. My future is bright. God's promises are true, and his word is sure. With God as my helper, I will be all he wants me to be, do all he wants me to do, and receive all he wants me to receive. These days are glory days. Thank you, Lord, for the promise of fresh starts of new seasons, of second chances. We receive that promise today. We beg you, Lord, to stand in bold defiance against the evil one who wants to fill our thoughts with doubts and fears. Today, Lord, we lean into you. Forgive the sins of the one who speaks, for they are many, and help us to see Christ and just Jesus. Through the mighty name of Christ, we offer this prayer. And all the church said, our dog ran away last Sunday. Yeah, dog lovers of the world, join with me in a collective groan. A neighbor, Mark McCurley, had tipped me off to a great place for dogs to romp and run. So I told Andy, my dog, all about it. Andy, I said, I know of a dog's dream come true. It's a creek bed with a wide meadow, no cars, no leashes, no fences, nothing but stuff to sniff and trees to wet and crevices to explore. He looked up at me and he said, oh, Master Max, you put the wow in bow wow. (laughs) That sounds to me like the doggy version of glory days. I said, indeed it is. It is a canine promised land. But let me warn you, you must stay close to me. This pasture is several miles from our house, and if you wander off, you may not be able to find your way home. And let me warn you, deer will entice. Rabbits will lure. There may even be a seductive poodle on the path. (laughs) Remain on high alert. Heed my voice. Stay close to me. I will, he yelped. But did he? No. The moment I unleashed him, he ran away, and he scooted up a 20-foot tall bluff. Andy, I shouted. He stopped and looked down on me. Andy, I said, come back here. And my poor dog was in a moral dilemma. (laughs) To one side, he heard the luring voices of Sodom and Gomorrah. (laughs) Come on, Andy, they were saying to him. Come on, let's have a little fun. Come on. To the other, he heard the voice of his wise, seasoned, and very handsome (laughs) master. Come here, Andy, I said. So he looked away, and then he looked my way, and he looked away, and then he looked my way, and then in a flash, in the snap of a finger, he was gone. My first thought, Deanlin is going to kill me. (laughs) So I went on a rescue mission. My voice went hoarse from calling his name. My legs grew weak from climbing. It took me 45 minutes. But finally, there he was. Beneath a tree, exhausted, thirsty, trembling, and can I say, repentant. (laughs) He looked up at me and he said, go ahead. Use me as a sermon illustration. (laughs) 
He said, I entered the promised land, but I forgot my master. I wasn't intending to use my prodigal pup as an illustration. But since he offered, the story does fit our study. God was concerned that Joshua and the children of Israel would enter the promised land and forget his voice. Canaan was full of new, strange, and alluring temptations. Hence, he issued this pre-promised land caution. Only be strong and courageous, that you may observe to do all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right or to the left, that you may prosper in all you do. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do all according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and you will have good success. Remember the context. God is calling Joshua to lead two million ex-slaves out of the wilderness across the Jordan River into the promised land. He wants to take them from the east side to the west side where they can inherit their inheritance. And so what does God give Joshua? Well, in chapter 1, God gives Joshua the promise of his presence. That was last week where he said, I will fight for you. I will be with you. But God also gives him the promise of his word. God will speak to him. That's this week. Like you and me, Joshua had a Bible. <laughs> this may surprise you to know this, but yes, he had a set of scriptures. His Bible consisted of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. The five books were written by Moses and carried in the Ark of the Covenant. But though Joshua possessed the Scriptures, God wanted the Scriptures to possess Joshua. So he encourages him to first elevate the Word. This is where you fill in the blanks if you like to fill in blanks. Elevate the Word. God said, the law, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Now that's interesting. Why did he say mouth? Why not brain or heart. Well, what is the mouth used for? It's used for chewing and it's used for speaking primarily. So there's the message. Let God's word be something you chew on, meditate on, think about, rehearse, recite over and over again. Chew on it and speak it. Speak the word. Speak it to others. Speak it to yourself. Speak it into problems. Be one who declares the Word of God. Rely on its wisdom. Encourage others with it. New Testament verse says, Let the Word of Christ dwell in you rich, richly, teaching and admonishing one another. You see, Canaan is loud with enemy voices. The devil cranks up the volume on the west side of the Jordan. Once we begin coming out of the wilderness and stepping into our inheritance, into our possession, living out God's promises, Satan comes at us and he cranks up the volume on the voices of doubt and fear. So a key for promised land living is let God's word be the authoritative word in your life. I have a friend who's taking flying lessons. He wants to learn to fly. The pilot is teaching him to trust the instruments. In an unusual thing, but I understand that they do this all the time. He, he put visors on his eyes, so he had to rely on the panel. The teacher then rocked and rolled the plane so much that the student was dizzy and the equilibrium was off. And the teacher turned the controls over to his pupil. My friend thought he had leveled out the plane without using the, the instruments. But when he looked at the instruments, he realized he was going straight down. So he had to make a choice. Am I going to trust my instinct or am I going to trust 
the instruments. Life has a way of knocking us off balance. Death, disease, or deceit, or troubles come our way. And we think we know how to fix our problems. God says, don't trust your inner ear. (laughs) Don't trust your inner self. You need a voice outside of yourself. Let this be the authoritative word in your voice. Rely on Scripture. I realize how countercultural that commission is. We live in a society that is increasingly turning away from Scripture. We live in a society that says there is no authority. Or if there is authority, that authority is you. Or that authority is on the news. Or that authority is your coach or your teacher. Or that authority is on the afternoon talk show. I realize what we're called to do goes against what our society says to do. But we're not the first. We're not the first people to be called to heed a different voice in a very pluralistic society. The Apostle Paul was speaking to a young pastor by the name of Timothy. Timothy lived in a city that was famous for competing philosophies, the city of Ephesus. And so Paul told young Timothy, as you lead your church, do this. You should continue following the teachings you learned. You know they are true because you trust those who taught you. Since you were a child, you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise. That wisdom leads to salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he says, all scripture is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. What a remarkable statement. All Scripture is inspired by God or breathed by God is the literal translation, as if to say it comes from within God. These words come from God. What a remarkable claim to be made about a book that all of us can read. It's a remarkable book. The Bible is remarkable in composition, composed over 16 centuries by 40 different authors, written by soldiers, shepherds, farmers, and fishermen, begun in lonely Arabia by Moses, completed on the lonely island of Patmos by John, penned by kings in palaces, shepherds in tents, and even prisoners in prisons. Was it possible that 40 writers primarily unknown to each other, writing in three different languages and in different countries, separated by time, three times the period since Columbus discovered America, was it possible for them to produce a book of singular theme unless there was behind it an author, one who designed the pages and the words? It is remarkable in composition. It is remarkable in durability. It is the single most published book in history. The Bible has been the number one seller in the world for 300 years. Number one seller in the world for 300 years. Years. It has survived bans, burnings, outlived all of its opponents. The death knoll has been played a hundred times, but God's word continues. The Bible is remarkable in prophecy. Did you know that the pages of your Bible contain over 300 fulfilled prophecies about the life of Jesus alone? 500 years before Jesus was born, a substantial biography had already been written about his life. What are the odds? Imagine if we saw something similar today. If somebody came across a book that had been written in, I don't know, 1900 that prophesied two world wars an atomic bomb, the assassination of a president, the assassination of a civil rights leader. Wouldn't we pick up that book and say, there's something special about this book, folks. There is something special about this book. But you know, the biggest test of the Bible is, does it work? If you read the words and put them in practice, does it work? The Apostle Paul says that it is useful for teaching, 
for showing people what is wrong in their lives, for correcting faults, and for teaching how to live right. This is the big test of Scripture, practicality. Do the teachings of the Bible make a difference? Well, there's really only one way to find out, and that's this. Integrate the Word. Not only do we elevate the Word, we integrate it. We click the save button on the Bible. How many of you know what the save button is on a computer? I love the save button. I love the save button. Because once you click the save button, what happens? All those words that are so vulnerable, exposed to the elements on your screen, they sink deep, 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 deep. They take that invisible elevator and they go down, 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 down into the bowels of your computer and they are stored on the hard drive. You permanently change the landscape of the hard drive and nobody can get to them. As long as those words are just floating on your screen, we know what can happen, right? I mean, that's why we call the cursor the cursor. We curse that little thing that comes along and gobbles up those words that we don't, oh, come back, come back, it's too late. But if you press the save button, if you let those words descend into the innards of the computer, ah, you got them forever. Are you clicking the save button on Scripture? Are you letting it descend into your heart where it really makes a difference? It's possible to hear Scriptures. It's possible to hear teaching and never click the save button. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. It's when truth is known, when it's, when it's deposited within us, that's when freedom happens. You know the truth. You are clicking the save button. You are experiencing truth when what you've heard with your ears or read with your eyes makes a difference in your life. It's as simple as that. You've experienced truth when what you've heard with your ears or read with your eyes makes a difference in your decisions, in your emotions, in your actions. If you don't click the save button, the words don't have any impact. There's an example of not clicking the save button in the New Testament. Jesus once invited his disciples to get into a boat with him. He said these words, let us go over to the other side. So they did. They got into the boat. En route to the other side, a storm pounced on the boat. The Scripture says a furious squall came up, and the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Buckets and buckets of water fell out of the sky and threatened to overturn the boat. The disciples turned to Jesus and found him sound asleep. They woke him up. They said, don't you care if we drown? Well, Jesus woke up. He stood up. He told the storm to shut up. And then he turned to the disciples and he said this, do you still have no faith? Now, we might read that and say, come on, Jesus. I mean, it's understandable that they're afraid. Why so stern of a rebuke? The sea was raging. The water was churning. Why did Jesus scold them for being afraid? Simple. They didn't take Jesus at his word. Remember what he said to them? He said, come, let us go to the other, what? Side. He had said they would go to the other side. He did not say, come, let us go to the middle of the lake and drown. <laughs> But when the storm came, they heard the sound of the storm and they forgot the word of Christ. They didn't click the save button. Storms are coming your way. They're coming my way. Maybe even this week, you'll find yourself caught in the middle of a lake and you'll have a choice. 
Do you listen to the words of Christ or do you listen to the sounds of the crisis? Do you heed the promises of Scripture or do you just listen to the noise of the storm? Do you ponder the pain of your problems or do you turn to the Prince of Peace? Promised land people, let the words of Jesus trump fear. Promised land people have learned this habit of remembering, recording, receiving, and rehearsing the words of God so that when they find themselves in a storm, they say, okay, Jesus said, Jesus promised, the scripture says, or when they find themselves confused or even facing temptation like Andy was, they say, I'm going to heed the voice of my master. The promised land life, folks, boils down to this, taking God at his word. People in the wilderness, they have just enough of God's word to get them out of slavery into the wilderness. But people of the promised land are trusting God's word daily, leaning into it regularly to lead them and guide them. This means that the Bible is the single most important tool in your spiritual growth. We can say this with confidence because of the remarkable research and work of Greg Hawkins and Callie Parkinson. I hope you'll have an opportunity to meet Greg Hawkins and his wonderful family, Lynn, Jack, Aubrey, and John. Greg is a recent addition to our leadership team who comes from Chicago. He's the Minister of Ministry Development. Such a delightful, delightful man. And you might say that he literally wrote the book on spiritual development. He and Callie Hawkins surveyed over a thousand, I'm sorry, Callie Parkinson surveyed over a thousand churches in the United States. They went on a search for Joshua's. They went on a search for people who were really enjoying and living out and victorious in their faith. They searched for the common denominator of people who were experiencing a promised land life. And what they discovered raised the eyebrows of at least a thousand pastors. The key to spiritual growth, they discovered, is not increased church attendance or involvement in spiritual activities People don't grow in Christ because they're busy at church. People grow in Christ simply because they read and trust their Bibles. Look at this paragraph in their book. Nothing has a greater impact on spiritual growth than reflection on Scripture. If churches could do only one thing to help people at all levels of spiritual maturity grow in their relationship with Christ, their choice is clear. They would inspire, encourage, and equip their people to do what? To read the Bible. <laughs> you expected something more glamorous? Maybe something more mystical, a little sexier, <laughs> a little more elaborate, something that required a trip to the top of a mountain or 40 days in a desert or something bizarre or sacrificial when really it's all right here. And what God gave Joshua, God has given us a Bible. And he gave him this command, do according to all that is written in it. This was God's command, remember, to the commander Joshua was in charge of two million people. He was the undisputed five-star general of his generation. And yet even he, the man in charge, was called to live in submission to a higher voice. Not to make laws, but to apply laws. Not to create new philosophies, but to understand God's philosophy. God didn't command him to seek a spiritual experience or pursue a personal revelation or long for a goosebump-giving emotion. 
His word to him is his word to us. Open God's word. If you do, then you can, lastly, anticipate a reward. God says, you will make your way prosperous and have good success. This is the only time in the Old Testament that the words prosperous and success share the same sentence. This is what is called an emphasized promise, a repeated promise to make a point. When you study God's word, good things happen. Align yourself with God's word and you can expect prosperity and success. We might cringe at a statement like that because we tend to associate the word prosperity with money. Well, God does bless his children with success. Sometimes it is financial success. It is. Sometimes, though, the Bible uses prosperity and success in terms of emotions, in terms of relationships, in terms of peace. God may bless you with increased financial success. He may increase you with more friends. He may increase you with a good night's sleep. He may increase you with a lifetime of healthy and happy years. He may fill your quiver with kids and grandkids. God has all types of ways of giving his children prosperity and success. But we believe this, that to the degree that we align ourselves with God's word, good things are going to happen. Let's learn a lesson from what God told Joshua. Let's elevate the word. Let's integrate the word. And let's anticipate the reward. And let's also learn a lesson from my sweet little dog, Andy. You know, he caught me as I was leaving today to come to church. And he stopped me. He said, Master Max... I love it when he calls me that. <laughs> he said, Master Max, is today the day you tell the story of the time I was lost? I said, yes, it is. He said, well, tell the church I have learned my lesson. I said, what's the lesson? He said, whenever I'm too far from the voice of my master, life is rough, rough, rough. That's what he said. <laughs> That's what he said. I promise. Who would have thought? Who would have thought that he would make such a comment? <laughs> Folks, we don't know how to get home safely. We don't. And we can easily get lost. And it's a wild world out there. But you have a heavenly father. You have a master who will guide you home. Heed his voice. Heed his voice. And you will enjoy a promised land life. Amen? Amen? Thank you, Lord, so much for your teachings, for your blessings, for your guidance. We confess that we, like Andy, have wandered away. Most, if not all of us, have passed through seasons in our lives in which we disregarded your word or even made a mockery of your word we're very sorry father for that because we see where that takes us and we see where that's taking other people we don't want to go there so today we we recommit ourselves to be people of the scripture we recommit our church to be a church of the bible we pray father that our finest moments of any day could be the moments we sit before you with open bible and open hearts. Through Christ we pray, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.